My task today is uh, in this lecture to reflect on the U.S.-Russia relationship over a very long time, over the 210 years that it's existed since the U.S. Uh, was recognized by Imperial Russia in 1807. I'm going to drone on for about an hour, and then uh, there may be a little bit of time for you to fight back or ask questions if you have them. Over that 210-year period, the United States has, in fact, dealt with three Russias. It dealt with Imperial Russia, it dealt with Soviet Russia, and now it deals with what I call independent Russia. In all three periods, the United States as a foreign policy actor was also very different, and the international system of what they were part was different in each of those periods. Uh, indeed, each of those periods uh, has an evolution within it that I would divide into two parts, two parts, so that 19th century two parts, 20th two parts, and even our short 21st century two parts. Uh, I want to set the U.S.-Russia interaction in the context of this evolving, uh, sometimes fundamentally changed international setting in order, first of all, to explain how the relationship was affected by the international setting of which it was a part, uh, and in turn how it in then affected or influenced that international setting, 19th century, 20th century, 21st century. Uh, secondly, to explore the ways in which the fundamentals in each country, their political system, the dynamics of politics within each, affected this interaction between the international setting and the relationship between the two countries. Third, to explore some of the enduring factors uh, that, that prevailed over the 210 years. Uh, and then fourth and finally, as if not more important, discontinuities over that 210 year period. When the breaks were, what's, what was significant, what significantly that distinguishes one from another. Were I, to, were I to, in a stark fashion, characterize the three periods, I'd say the following. The 19th century period for me the, in the relationship is one of distance and disengagement. Distance and disengagement, where the core feature was commerce, 19th century. 20th century, I would characterize as direct but alienated, and the core feature was security. This third period, much shorter, uh, in my judgment, is, uh, is more complex. It is more difficult to characterize in this fashion. It is engaged again. We certainly are engaged, but uh, in many of the categories of engagement, it's asymmetrical. And in its content, it has been very volatile. In terms of its core feature, again, it's security, uh, but in more ambiguous forms. To begin at the beginning, the establishment of, rela of relations in 1807, this was not as early as it might have been. The Treaty of Paris, by which Great Britain recognized the independence of the United States, was in the fall of 1783. So it took Imperial Russia 25 years to come to terms with the American Revolution. In the, 20, in the 20th century, it took the United States 16 years to come to terms with the Bolshevik Revolution. Roosevelt recognized the Soviet Union in 19, 1933. In both cases, part of the reason was ideological, but only part of the reasons. Catherine, Catherine II, Catherine the Great, after the French Revolution, which follows the American Revolution, had no appetite for popular political revolutions. Uh, and a century later, the United States, U.S. leaders and Western leaders uh, were not sympathetic to, had very little appetite for the Bolsheviks and what they were substituting for Tsarist autocracy. So at that level, yes, there were ideological impulses, if you will. But th there were other reasons as well. In February 1780, February 1780, Catherine the Great issued the Declaration on the Principles of Neutrality and invited the Baltic states to join what would be the First League of Armed Neutrality. First League of Armed Neutrality. That notion of armed neutrality, by the way, was a fundamental objective of Russian foreign policy in the, in the 19th century. But the First League of Armed Neutrality, uh, 
Uh, and as I say, brought in the Baltic states uh, in order to form that. It would be joined by a few others a bit later. In December of that year, we're talking about 1780, the Continental Congress in the United States appointed Francis Dana, who was a prominent US politician from New England. At that time, he was serving as secretary to John Adams, who was our minister in Paris, uh, to be the first minister to the uh, court of Empress Catherine II. His task, as assigned by the Continental Congress, was to secure recognition from Russia, uh, and to do so by seeking admission to this new league of armed neutrality with the Baltic states, and recently Denmark had joined it, because in doing that, the United States would, in effect, be recognized by all the members of the League of Armed, armed Neutrality. Catherine, Catherine refused to receive him, uh, and he cooled his heels in St. Petersburg for two years without ever being received by Catherine. Uh, the reason was that Catherine did not want to offend the British by recognizing the colonies as independent before, uh, before Great Britain had done so. I might say as an interesting aside, particularly for someone who now comes from New England, but for all of us who remember John Quincy Adams, our sixth president, John Quincy Adams was Dana's French interpreter. He was 14 years old. He had been with his father in Paris. He also... Uh, probably was his Russian interpreter, because John Quincy Adams, as a 14-year-old, knew six, six languages. Uh, in any event, uh, as I say, Dana was stuck in St. Petersburg without much success. The episode that I'm talking about, uh, the two-year period that Dana was attempting to achieve the objectives of the Continental Congress vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Catherine the Great's Russia, I, I think embodies two features that captured the essence of both countries uh, approach to and role within the international system of the day, uh, and that would, in many ways, foreshadow what the, what the characteristic of approach and role of the two countries would be in the century that would follow in the 19th century. On the Russian side, Catherine's primary concern in the context of European politics was not to get drawn into a conflict between France and Great Britain over the American Revolution. France had become an ally of the colonies as a result of the alliance that was signed in, 17, uh, in 1778 uh, in the context of that war. Uh, Great Britain, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Catherine the Great, Russia's primary objective in this context of not getting drawn in was protecting its commerce. Hence the reason for the League of Armed Neutrality, because the key route for commerce for Russia during this period was through the Baltic. This is Catherine's primary concern. She looked on the American uh, Revolution with considerable distaste, but Catherine, as early as 1775, thought that George III had made a hash of things, and she expected as early as that that the colonies would, would become independent. Uh, but as I say, she didn't want to move in a way that would offend Great Britain until Great Britain made the move herself. Uh, in short, from a Russian perspective during that period of time, the American Revolution, what was happening in this part of the world, was a sideshow. Uh, it was an awkward extension of what really mattered to Catherine, and that was what was happening in Europe, and in the international system focused on Europe during that period of time. Uh, moreover, uh, throughout the American Revolution, Catherine had been coping with revolts and difficulties of her own, but in Crimea. Because after seven, the war with uh, Turkey, between Russia and Turkey, that, that was underway from 1768 until 1774, right before the American Revolution, Crimea became, having been essentially removed from the authority of the Ottoman Empire, a dependency of Russia. And a series of revolts followed in Crimea throughout most of the years of the American Revolution until they were finally repressed. And in August of 1783, Russia did what you saw Russia do more recently, it annexed Crimea one month before Britain signed the Treaty of Paris ending the American Revolutionary War. On the U.S. side, 
The revolutionary's primary objective, as I said, was to secure recognition for the new republic. Uh, but the second part of that was to stay clear of this European political system that was the centerpiece of Russian foreign policy. Uh, when Congress uh, voted to recall Dana, because uh, as the uh, British defeat in, uh, in North America was becoming evident, and that was true by 1782, the United States no longer needed and didn't want to be part of a league of armed neutrality, a European alliance. And therefore, the decision was to recall them, not the least because at that point, they were beginning to put pressure on Dana in St. Petersburg for the United States to join the League of Armed, of armed Neutrality. Uh, the Continental Congress voted in June of 1983, so before the annexation of Crimea, before the Treaty of Paris, but in June of 1983, to get Dana the hell out of St. Petersburg before anything happened around, around the treaty. Uh, and when they did so, when they recalled him in June of 1983, the resolution read the following. It said, as the true interest of these states requires that they should be as little as possible entangled in the politics and the controversies of European nations. That's June 1783. Most of you know it more famously from the farewell address of George Washington in 1796 at the end of his second presidential term when he warned against entangling alliances. And as I say, that then became the guideline for US policy, its relationship to the international system of the day, the European system, for the 19th century. And it was reaffirmed at various points. As late as 1852, in the Whig Party's political program, they formally reaffirmed that statement from George Washington's, uh, from George Washington's uh, farewell address, as I say. Uh, even Thomas Jefferson, in 1823, Thomas Jefferson in 1823 is an 80 year old man. And in 1823, he said the following, I have ever deemed it fundamental for the United States never to take an active, never to take active in the quarrels of Europe. Their political interests are entirely different from ours. Their mutual jealousies, their balance of power, their complicated alliances, their forms and principles of government are foreign to us. They are nations of eternal war. Hence, you begin a fundamental disjuncture between the US approach and relationship to the international system from that of Russia that will have a profound effect on their relationship. For Russia, from Peter's day forward, that is from the 18th century forward, Russia had become ever more squarely an important player and component in an international system that was European-centric. Uh, at the beginning of, uh, at the beginning for the United States, which is now Catherine's day forward, uh, the uh, United States primary purpose uh, was to stay clear of that international system. At the beginning, of the next century, when you think about relationship of each country to the international system, things have changed again. Uh, because at the beginning of the next century, the 20th century, Russia, Imperial Russia, is this faltering state. Uh, and it's in the context of an international system that's now under stress, that soon will produce World War I. Then in 1917, at the conclusion of World War I, Russia, as a result of the revolution, is essentially ostracized from the international system, pushed aside in this context. The United States, meanwhile, uh, has attempted to enter the international system that it's not been a part of in the 19th century under Wilson. And his idea, his idea which is to govern the new international system, which is a League of Nations, but that effort at entering fails and the U US withdraws again because the US doesn't become a part of this organizing principle in the international system, the League of Nations. Um, in the last half of the 20th century, as I say, each of these periods is, uh, is divided into two. In the last half of uh, the 20th century, the Soviet Union and the United States emerge as the two hem hegemons that dominate a divided, that is a polar international system, fundamentally different from what has existed at any point 
in the past. Uh, and then if you turn to the current period, this much shorter period, uh, in the first 25 years after the end of the Cold War, it appeared that Russia, as a result of its weakness, the collapse of the country, the system, and the rest of it, was now fading from the center of the international system, which it had been so central during the Cold War in a bipolar world. The United States was at the very center of the post-Cold War international system. The French foreign minister called it a hyperpower now, not merely a uh, superpower. And then in this too, this short second, uh, third period has two halves from my point of view. So if you speak about the present period, Russia is reasserting itself, uh, particularly in the international system's critical Eurasian core. We'll be talking about that in the, course, in the course of the week. I know you've already been working on that issue with Trenin and with others that preceded it, Wojtylowski and uh, Rojansky and so on. Uh, the United States' role and place in this international system is now uh, is, has now lost clarity, even if its power has not. The United States is not, in relative terms, weaker than it was before. But its place in the international system, its role, its identity is losing clarity at the present moment. Uh, well, out of this summary, it's only logical that, uh, that these juxtapositions in U.S. and Russia vis-a-vis -vis the international system uh, have had a profound effect on on the relationship over time, do now and will into the future. For roughly the first hundred years of the US-Russia relations, uh, the, two, the two powers operated in essentially different contexts, fundamentally different contexts, creating fundamentally different foreign policy imperatives for both of them and thus influencing the way they interacted. Russia, as I said, was a major player in the international system an international system that was first dominated by the Napoleonic Wars and then the concert system that emerged out of it, the Congress of Vienna and the peace, uh, including the Holy Alliance at which it was the center, that is this uh, collaboration between the conservative monarchies, monarchies in the context of that, uh, deeply enmeshed in the uh, the fitful and rapidly uh, changing alliances, uh, alignments among Great Britain and France and Prussia and Austria uh, and the lesser subjects in that international system following 1812 and the outcome of the war, uh, ultimately embroiled in a war with the, uh, with the British, the French, the Ottoman Empire and Sardinia, the Crimean War in the mid-1850s. Um, and uh, in this period of time, the United States, I mean, as, I, as you can see, Russia is, is central to what was the dynamic of that 19th century system. The United States was determined to remain above it all. Its principal concerns were a flourishing uh, external commerce, most of which was with the former metropole, most of which throughout the 19th century was with, with uh, Great Britain. And as a result, Corollary to that, concerned with the maritime rights of neutrals. This was central to 19th century U.S. US foreign policy. Uh, in 1799, Catherine's son, Paul, Paul I, then uh, emperor, had created what was called the Russia America Company in order to deal with where the commercial interaction between the United States and Russia was most intense, which was the, north, the Northwest area. Uh, and where that commerce was dominated by fur trade. The Russia America Company was um, empowered by Paul I to essentially control that commercial interaction, that commercial trade. Uh, and gradually, Russia, the Russia America Company would extend its influence down the Alaskan coast into northern Canada, uh, into the Spanish portions of control of northern Canada and ultimately down to a region pretty close to where we are, where we are today. In 1821, 1821, now uh, Tsar Alexander I uh, declared the Northwest Territory, he issued uh, in 1821 
an ukaz. It was the 1821 ukaz. But in that, uh, in that order, that declaration, the Northwest Territory north of 51 degree latitude was to be under the authority of control administration of the Russia America, the Russia America uh, Company. Uh, this was a line that was far south of North, uh, of North uh, Arkhangel. Uh, North Arkhangel today in Canada is Sitka, which is not far from Juneau. But this, this push to the 51st uh, degree latitude was, as I say, far below that. Uh, he also, by the Ukaz of 1821, banned foreign ships from coming closer than 115 miles from off the coast of uh, Canada. It was one of the two major reasons for the Monroe Doctrine that was issued in 1823, the Ukaz 1821, the Monroe Doctrine, which proscribes further colonization within the Western Hemisphere. That also was inspired by what was happening to former Spanish colonies and what Spain was beginning to do in Latin America. But the Russian uh, Ukaz of 1821 was very important in doing that. The Monroe Doctrine in 1823 was heavily influenced, edited, written by John Quincy Adams, who is now Secretary of State in Monroe's administration. This would lead in 1824, one year later, to a U.S.-Russia treaty, the first treaty that the United States and Russia ever signed, a treaty in 1824 by which the Russians agreed not to establish any new colonial sites below 54 degrees 40. 54 degrees 40 is today the southern border of Alaska. That was done in 1824, and it was done rather easily because Alexander, given what I've been saying about relationship to an international system, found the Northwest, the part of North America, of distinctly secondary importance to what really mattered to Alexander I, which was Europe, uh, and to some extent, the expansion of, uh, of Russia that was still uh, in the process of moving, moving uh, eastward. Uh, this, however, is not the only reason why I characterized the 19th century with that general and stark characterization as being distant and disengaged. Uh, it's sometimes said, in fact, I've heard it frequently said, that throughout much of the 19th century, and therefore for much of the history of U.S.-Russia relations, that it has been basically a friendly or a cooperative relationship. And even at key moments in war that Russia has been allied with the United States, say the War of 1812 or the Civil War in, uh, in the 1860s, that's misleading. It is true that Russia, through various episodes in the 19th century, offered to mediate, uh, to help arbitrate uh, what was happening in each of these contexts. First during the Revolutionary War, uh, offered mediation. Then during the War of 1812, it offered mediation. Uh, it offered mediation over the disputed Treaty of Ghent, which was the treaty by which Britain and the United States settled the War of 1812. In 1820, 1821, there was a dispute between the United States and Great Britain over the interpretation or the implementation of the Treaty of Ghent. Russia offered to mediate in that context. It was only in that context that Russian mediation was accepted. Uh, in all the other cases, it was, uh, it was not accepted. Uh, and the basic point, from my point of view, is that Russia's reasons for offering to mediate were not a reflection of a special friendship to the United States or a desire to assist the United States in this context. They were for perfectly self-regarding reasons that had to do with what? Russia in a European-oriented international system. So for example, in the case of the 1812 war where Russia offered to mediate between the United States and Great Britain and North America, its primary reason was to free Great Britain's hand so that it could contribute more to the war against Napoleon in Europe. That was the principal reason why the Russians were pushing for it. Maybe the more useful contribution the Russians made in this area was during the Civil War uh, to uh, not to accept the initiative by France to mediate that war, which although it may not have been precisely France's objective, uh, the outcome of that would have aided the Southern Confederacy and Russia was not part of it. But a number of other countries weren't. 
as well, and it faded quite apart from whatever Russia's effort was in that context. Even Russia's decision uh, in 1863 during the war to send naval squadrons from the Baltic and from the Pacific to the United States, the Baltic fleet to New York and parts of the East Coast, uh, the Pacific squadron to, to the West Coast, including famously this part of the world where you still have records of that. Uh, that was not done to assist the United States during the Civil War, even though that's popularly the myth. In fact, the other day on the internet I saw somebody, a historian, giving a lecture in which he argued that that decision to send the naval squadrons to the United States during the Civil War uh, meant that Alexander II was Lincoln's only foreign friend. Uh, the reason we know now from looking at the archives and the way it was described internally within Russia was to protect both of those fleets, the Baltic fleet in particular, because what else is happening in 1863? The Polish insurrection with a fear that it would lead to a potential war with Britain and the fleet would be endangered. So it was essentially uh, to save the, uh, the fleets, even though they were well celebrated while they were here uh, with parades and special balls and host of other things. Uh, similarly, the sale of Alaska to the United States in 1867. Uh, Alaska, many of you know, uh, was sold to the United States for $7.2 million. The U.S. Congress objected because they thought the price was exorbitant. The most they were prepared to pay was $5.5 million for Alaska. But the reason for that, too, was not a gesture of cordiality, cordiality or friendship. It was because, first of all, the Russia-America Company had now failed. And secondly, Russia was suffering the economic hardships after the Crimean War. Uh, and that's the reason why we have Alaska today. Although I might tell you that the deputy, foreign, the deputy prime minister in, Great, in, uh, in Russia, Dmitry Ragozin, who is now head of an Arctic Council, has made statements saying that the Russians ought to recover lost colonial territory. Uh, so I'm not sure whether Alaska is endangered in the context of current US-Russia relations. I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not arguing that Russia's attitude toward the United States and the U.S. toward Russia was unfriendly or even that it was indifferent. Uh, I'm simply saying that for neither country was the other a priority. Uh, and the, the other country figured in the uh, foreign policy of the first only in a limited fashion, only as a function of other prim primary commitments. Um, there were cases where the United States cooperated with the Russians. In the Crimean War, the United States provided humanitarian aid to the front toward the end of that war. Uh, the United States uh, also aided Russian shipping in the, north, in the northwest area, this area that I've been talking about. Uh, and in the, in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-1878, the United States did provide Russia with naval ships um, and armaments. And of course, the famous instance is Teddy Roosevelt mediating the Russo-Japanese War, 1904-1905, uh, by pulling off the Portsmouth, New Hampshire peace in that period. But even there, on the US side, that was a function of a broader foreign policy. Uh, Roosevelt's primary concern was protecting America's commitment to the open door policy in China, which was threatened in part by the course of that Russo-Japanese War. By the second half of the 19th century, other factors, this being the second half of uh, the second phase of, of this first period, other factors were beginning to enter into the relationship that have an echo in the subsequent period, in fact, down to our, uh, down to our own day. Uh, abolitionists in the United States celebrated the emancipation of serfs in Russia in 1861, which was ahead of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, but by the late 1860s, Russian uh, US newspapers, US reporters began reporting and accounting for growing anti-Semitic actions within Russia, including in particular 1871 and the pogrom by authorities in Odessa. And that would only increase over the next decade, uh, especially after 1881 and the assassination of Alexander II. And then on top of that, the press reports began to stress the repressive character 
of the uh, imperial regime in Russia. That uh, culminated in 1891 with the publication of, uh, of uh, uh, Siberia and the Exile System. Siberia and the Exile System by George Kennan, who was George Kennan, the George Kennan you know, it was his uncle, and that had an enormous impact in the United States. Um, the ultimate upshot of this, and then I'm finished with this first part, was in 1911 when the U.S. House of Representatives abrogated the 1832 Treaty of Commerce. That was the second treaty we signed, and notably it was commerce, that had governed U.S.-Russian economic commercial relations throughout the 19th century. 1911, the U.S. House of Representatives, by a vote of 301 to 1, if you have in mind the vote on sanctions in the last week or so in Washington, 301 abrogated the Treaty of Commerce of 1832. The reason for that was that the Russians had stopped accepting visas from Russian Jews who had emigrated to the United States and wished to return for a visit. That was the reason that treaty was abrogated in, uh, in 1911. It may also have been a factor, one other point, may have been a factor, may have been a factor in Wilson's decision to enter World War I. It made it, it was easier for him to join the Entente in, uh, at the beginning of the war, or at the point where the US came into the war, because the last autocracy in that Entente had fallen with the February Revolution in 1917, and then the Tsar's Nicholas first abdication in, uh, in, in March the following month. Well, this leads to the second major period in U.S.-Russia relations, the 20th century. Uh, it is still more deeply divided, the two halves or the two parts, well, in this case, the two halves of the 20th century. From 1917 to 1941, Russia was weak. You all know that from the history of uh, the first years after the Bolshevik Revolution, the industrialization, the purges, uh, collectivization, what was happening within Russia through that period of time. Uh, it was in domestic turmoil. It was an outcast in the international system, as I've said. It was more an object of the international system through that period, at least from 1917 to, let's say, 1933 and the rise of Hitler, than it was a uh, subject of that system. Uh, this was a shattered but still intact uh, international system. Uh, of, of, uh, of multipolar character with many major powers. The United States, having abandoned the idea of collective security through the League of Nations um, and standing aside from uh, the international system through much of the, the interwar period was increasingly headed into isolationism. Uh, in sharp contrast, in the second half, after World War II, the two emerged, as I said, as the dual uh, hegemons presiding over a bipolar international system, the fulcrum of which was still Europe, but the violent arenas in which it unfolded was the outside global context, in particular the Third World. During this second period, across this second period, the domestic factor uh, impact on the international dimension was, I think, more intense, more, more pronounced than in the 19th century, because it wasn't merely the tension that was created between competing political systems, monarchy versus representative democracy. It now had a more fundamental ideological basis, a more fundamental ideological chasm that divided the two countries, not just competing political and economic systems, but fundamentally different understanding of history and the role of the two countries in it, at least in the, first, uh, in the first half of the period I'm talking about. Indeed, unlike the period of non-recognition after the American Revolution, the 16-year period from 17 to 1933 is largely explained by the ideological factor, which then merged with domestic and international factors, the international factor being the unresolved debt question left over from obligations that had been incurred by Imperial Russia. Uh, there was, however, between the two parts of the 20th century, in my view, a variance in the way in which this ideological chasm with its political and economic uh, 
manifestations, ontologies about history and the like, played out. Uh, I would argue that the difference, however, was more because of uh, the international system and the place of the two countries in it than it was because uh, of a, cont a contrast between a capitalist democratic system versus uh, uh, communism, a communist system. Uh, thus, for example, while Wilson was, uh, Woodrow Wilson at the very beginning of this period, was repulsed by the Bolshevik regime of whom his Secretary of State, a man named Robert Mansing, said the following. Already in 1918, Lansing said, uh, the Bolshevik system is the most hideous and monstrous thing that the human mind has ever conceived. Uh, but uh, there was that recognition, probably Wilson shared a good deal of that. Uh, but it was, it was qualified by, first of all, the fact that he believed as a general principle that intervening in revolutionary situations was a mistake, that it was likely to produce a worse outcome than an intervention might be able to generate. Uh, this was con consistent with his commitment to self-determination at some, at some level. Uh, it was also, as he expressed it in an interesting article that he wrote in the Atlantic Monthly in, in 1923, the following, uh, that is a, a recognition that there were reasons for the Bolshevik Revolution we ought to be sensitive to. He said he recognized the injustices that had produced the Bolshevik Revolution and might do elsewhere. Is the capitalist system unimpeachable? Which is another way of asking have capitalists generally used their power for the benefit of the countries in which their capital is employed and for the benefit of fellow men? So there was a certain sensitivity of why revolutions of this kind were occurring. And then add to that, that he believed, I think he believed that Bolshevism would be transient and that once it passed, it was likely to lead to a more democratic, to a more democratic attitude. So you add those three things up. And even though the United States intervened in the civil war in Russia during that period of time, uh, I think uh, that, that it was with reservation because of all of these other considerations for Wilson. He thought about the Bolshevik Revolution based on what he as an academic, Princeton uh, elsewhere, had uh, concluded about the French Revolution and as a practical matter what he'd learned as a result of the Mexican Revolution, 1913 to 1916. And he said at the end of that in the context of the Mexican case that his policy was one of watchful waiting. I think that was essentially what, at the outset, he was thinking when, when, when we were first reacting to Bolshevik uh, uh, Soviet Russia at that point. Uh, yes, there was interaction during this 16-year period of time, intercourse between the two countries. There was a remarkable food relief mission that was led by Herbert Hoover in uh, 1921 to 1923. There were efforts by enterprising Americans to do some business. Uh, Averill Harriman, who was the, who was the uh, uh, patron uh, who endowed the institute that I directed at Columbia, the Harriman Institute in the 1920s, cut deals in order to develop manganese products in southern Russia in the 1920s. There were a number of others. And in the 1930s, during the uh, forced draft industrialization under the five-year plans, a sizable number of American workers, Detroit auto manufacturers and others, went to work within Russia. But even after Roosevelt established relations in the fall of 1933, the U.S.-Russia engagement was still very limited. Uh, after 1934, when Russia was admitted to the League of Nations, and at that point, I would argue, Russia ceased to be the isolated subject within international politics and now becomes, again, a player in international politics. Even when uh, Russia, in 1934, joined the League of Nations, as uh, Mussolini and Hitler's countries were leaving the League, um, the, um, the Soviet Union uh, was drawn uh, into the international system as a major player, but the play was with Britain and with France, not with the United States during that period, post-1934. The United States, standing outside the League of Nations, um, its isolationism growing, America first, it was called at the time, uh, was not a significant factor as the uh, Europeans, including the Russians, struggled to deal with uh, 
uh, rise of fascism in Nazi Germany and to deal with the lands in between. That is Czechoslovakia and Hungary and those countries and the agreements that Russia and France tried to work out in the name of mutual security. It's true, Stalin's, in my view, Stalin's embrace of uh, mutual security, that is the efforts between France and Soviet Union in order to provide some kind of guarantees to Czechoslovakia and some of the Balkan states during that period of time, didn't represent a buy-in into the existing international system, far from that in my view, or an acceptance of the principle of collective security, that is the principle underlying the League of Nations, it was essentially, from my point of view, a convenient strategic choice on Stalin's part in order to deal with the rise of Nazi Germany, which he ultimately dealt with in another way in 1939 with the non-aggression pact that he signed with Hitler's Germany. The dividing line between the two halves of this second period, indeed, indeed the dividing line between two worlds was World War II. The war, which was in its essence a, a marriage of convenience of Russia, the United States, and Great Britain, and the others that were part of it, uh, did not transform the underlying factors that were driving and shaping U.S.-Russia relations before and that would drive them afterwards, not just U.S.-Soviet, but Soviet-Western relations during that period of time. But it did leave open the question of how long that kind of wartime collaboration could be prolonged into the period after the war? That was a question in 1944 into 1945. The answer came very quickly uh, with ratchet-like effects as the result of things that happened toward the end of the war militarily, who occupied what territory, and secondly, what uh, each did within those territories uh, and, and launched us into what we got then, the second period, which was the Cold War. What comes next in the second half of this second period is like none, uh, like nothing that had ever occurred before in this 210 year period of time. The international system was now bipolar. It had not been for millennia bipolar, uh, opposed to the multipolarity that we had been accustomed to in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. Uh, and uh, the United States and the Soviet Union had moved to the center of the system, never before. Everything I've said up to this point, was that the case? Relations among the major players, beginning with the United States and the Soviet Union, was now dominated by a new and historic phenomenon, that is the intrusion of nuclear weapons in a nuclear era. So for you young people, your parents, which is my generation, they spent much of their lives, have spent much of their life, I have much of my life, living now in a bipolar nuclear world. Uh, and that has been critical it was critical to the U.S.-Soviet relationship throughout that period of time. Uh, it was dominated by the Cold War, the original Cold War. And the Cold War raises an interesting analytical problem that we didn't discuss, didn't even think of during the Cold War. And it's very little discussed today, even though it figures in some of the arguments that we're having about the state of the current relationship, adversarial relationship. That question is, was the Cold War coterminous with the bipolar international system? Were they one and the same? Or if not coterminous, is it possible that one began before the other, ended before the other? Uh, and that leads to further questions. Was bipolarity essential to the Cold War? Or could you have, can you have, do we have Cold War in what is a multipolar context? So interesting questions that most people have not didn't wrestle with at the time and have not even now. That depends on your notion of what the Cold War was. It was obviously an adversarial relationship fought by all means short of actual war with the risk that it could tilt into a real war. Uh, today, the relationship is again adversarial, deeply adversarial. But the question is, how different is it from the original Cold War. So you get the first set of characteristics of what the original Cold War was from 1948 until, depending on when you think, so, when you think it ended, uh, 1989, uh, 1990 with the collapse of um, the wall and the unification of Germany. 
1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. I don't know what your date is. I'll come back to that point in a moment. Uh, and during that period of time, the essential characteristics of the Cold War are well rehearsed these days. I certainly hear it in response to an argument with a book that, uh, that Anna referred to, which I call Return to Cold War, so you know where I stand on the issue. The first is that during that period of time, the Cold War, whether it was coterminous or not, encompassed the entire international system. The international system was within the Cold War, the Cold War dominated the international system. Secondly, it had a fundamental animus that was ideological, that drove the competition between ideological, uh, between political and economic systems. And third, it unfolded under the shadow of nuclear Armageddon every day. As a kid, I, Bill, Bill Potter, I'm not sure you're old enough, uh, at school, uh, we used to have drills and where we were supposed to go and following these yellow and black pinwheel signs on the walls of our school in the case of a nuclear war. Those signs are all down. I'm sure you people have never run that drill when you were in high school or in grade school along the way. So nuclear Armageddon. Um, and the question is, uh, another way to put it, uh, this contest during this period of time, this book, uh, Return to Cold War, has been part of a round table discussion uh, on the book itself uh, that was held in something called H Diploma and Internet Forum on these things. Condi Rice was part of that, and she argued that the original Cold War was what she called an existential zero-sum game. Now, well, maybe that's what it was, an existential zero-sum game. The adversarial relationship today is not an existential zero-sum game. So those were characteristics of the Cold War. When you think about whether coterminous with the international system begin and end at the same time and so on, uh, you need to begin by saying, what's the Cold War in your mind? But for me, the Cold War had other characteristics as well, and just as important in distinguishing it and useful in understanding where we are today. Five of them, maybe six of them uh, in particular. First of all, and especially during the early years of that Cold War, 1948, the Berlin crisis through shortly after Stalin's death in 1953, each side held the other side wholly responsible for what had gone wrong. There was no introspection, there was no sense of interaction, it was the other side. And not because merely or primarily its behavior, but because of the nature of the other side. I call that the essence of the problem was the other side's essence. Secondly, what drove policy and attitudes on both sides in that period, 48 to 53, was uh, a notion that it wasn't simply a set of conflicts of interests in various places, it was a conflict of purpose. Third, if there was to be cooperation, even minor steps at cooperation during that period, and even sometime afterwards, it would only be transactional. You wouldn't have cooperation that led to cooperation, cumulative, that could be transformational of the relationship. Nobody thought in those terms at that time. That was characteristic of the original Cold War. Fourth, the assumption was it wouldn't change. It wouldn't change fundamentally until something fundamentally changed in the other side or the other side collapsed. That was the premise of Sources of Soviet Conduct, the article in which Kennan in 1947 in the Foreign Affairs article laid out the containment policy. And Stalin heads the same kind of uh, assumption that Andrei Zhdanov and others laid out in that period, 47 to 48, about imperialism and so on, until the 20th Party Congress and the de-Stalinization part of it. Uh, and fifth, cooperation, to the extent it existed, was always compartmentalized. Conflict was not. Conflict in one area bled into conflict in the other area, metastasized in that context. So the fundamental synergy was throughout that early period and much of the Cold War, what I would call a negative, a negative synergy, not a positive synergy. Uh, by the way, I think uh, the argument, we'll get to it in the, in the symposium when I make my case, the argument. I think while those first three qualities that I laid out, encompassing the entire international system, ideological impulses, basic animus, uh, nuclear Armageddon don't apply, the five principles I just laid out do apply to where we are today. They do apply today, um, including that last proposition that what we have underway in US-Russia relations today is no prospect of positive synergy. Uh, even we can talk in detail about what's going on right now, what Tillerson, 
said today after having spoken with Lavrov about hoping to make some progress on Ukraine or Syria otherwise, what we have is essentially negative synergy and you've been seeing it for the last, uh, for the last uh, several years, even in the new administration. These five characteristics that I've just laid out represent what I call irreconcilable subjectivities, the subjective that was driving things. And I believe very much in the, in the importance of subjective factors in international politics as opposed to objective factors and the power to influence. Uh, irreconcilable subjectivities. Uh, the story of what happens to the Cold War uh, is what happens to these two sets of characteristics. The ones that we all agree distinguish the original Cold War from the present, and then the second set of principles that I would argue have application to the present. In the case of the first, what you get over the 50 years, or I believe 39 years, of the original Cold War is essentially a diffusion of bipolarity. By the 1960s into the 1970s, bipolarity is beginning to weaken. As Stanley Hoffman, the fine IR specialist at Harvard once said, you begin to get a series of chessboards with different players playing on different chessboards, economic security, nuclear, and otherwise. Uh, secondly, the ideological impulse uh, as a basic animus doesn't disappear. It remains, but as a prism, that is a way in which Russian leaders, Soviet leaders, the way in which US leaders interpreted the world. It's still there as the prism through which they see it, but it ceases to be a lodestar for foreign policy gradually over that 39 year period of time until it has largely disappeared when Gorbachev is meeting with, uh, first with Reagan and then with Bush Sr. and so on. And nuclear Armageddon, we begin to manage it with the strategic arms control negotiations and the like. We don't eliminate it, haven't eliminated it even today, but we begin to manage it. In terms of the second set of characteristics, one by one, they are dulled over time. Beginning with this first thing, it's entirely the responsibility of the other side. The essence of the problem is the essence of the other side. The notion that nothing can change until something fundamental changes on the other side. I would argue that you've already come a long way towards softening or diffusing these characteristics by the time Nixon and Kissinger are doing detente with Brezhnev and Gromyko, even though that episode fails in that, in that period. But I do believe that the Cold War ended before the bipolar world ended. So in terms of timing and the issue of co whether they're coterminous or not, I believe they were separate things. That leads to the question of when did the original Cold War end? And as I said, you can do it either, what? at the maximum with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 91, or with German reunification in 1990. Many people will say that's the end of the Cold War because it, at that point, undermines the extended empire of the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact, Eastern Europe, and the like, or another way of defining it. My definition is when leaders in Washington and Moscow, and including Europe, thought the Cold War was over. And the point at which leaders in Moscow and Washington thought the Cold War was over was at the Malta summit in 1989. That's when Gorbachev said so to the Bush, uh, to Bush and Baker, and that's when Bush and Baker said to, uh, to Gorbachev and Shevardnadze, we agree, Cold War's over. No longer do we see one another as adversaries and, uh, and enemies. At that point, I would argue that what I called irreconcilable subjectivities had now become reconcilable. And you had someone like Gorbachev saying, the issue is no longer class struggle, it is the independence of societies. It is no longer a Europe that's divided by a Warsaw Pact and a NATO alliance, it's now what? A common European home that we're trying to build. And you had an American administration trying as it could, the Bush administration particularly, to think about what would be a new world order without ever quite filling in the ellipses and the gaps in the way in which they thought about it. Uh, let me introduce in this, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in what I'm talking about, uh, then the issue of whether reflecting over this 210 year period of time is useful, in what way is it useful? Its purpose is to help build some perspective on where we are and where we may be going in this relationship. And in order to do that, I think you want to focus on what have been both the continuities over the long haul, 
and more recently, say the last 50 years and particularly the last 25 years, and then as important, as I said at the outset, where the discontinuities are uh, over that period of time. In terms of the continuities uh, and um, in terms of honoring your patients, I'm now nearing the end of what I said would be my droning on. Uh, in terms of the continuities, for much of that 210 year period of time that we've been talking about, Russia was integral to the international system, whatever was that system, and for most of the time, as I say, it was a European focused, a European centered international system. While the United States stood to its side, although fundamentally at the end of World War II things change very, very basically in a way that are truly historic and that are the antecedents to the world that we live in, that we live in today. Uh, once the international system became global and no longer European focused, which is what happens clearly at the end of World War II, then the United States is at the very center of now a global international system. Uh, Russia, the Soviet Union is as well. Uh, in that respect, a major con discontinuity in this more recent period was what happened in the post-Cold War period, that is after 1991, when Russia faded as an influence or a central player in the international system. And what's interesting right now is the extent to which Russia, even though it's not fully recovered, even though it's vastly inferior by any material measure to the United States, is again once once more a central player in international politics. That's all happened within the two phases of this 25 year short third period of uh, US relations with an independent Russia. Uh, in the more recent second phase of the post-Cold War period, some would call it, that is the period that we're in right now, some people call it the post-post-Cold War era. Uh, as I said, Russia has returned to the central part uh, but in what is now a much larger cast of players, rising powers, China and India uh, and others potentially that will change further the character of this international system and where the United States is. Let me then introduce one further element of continuity that one might keep in mind over the long haul of history. Uh, at various points in a millennia of Russian history, Russia has gone through periods of what I would call great state transformation. It happened under Ivan IV, Ivan, the, uh, Ivan what we call popularly Ivan the Terrible, happened under Peter, happened under the great reform with Alexander II, happened under, under Lenin and then Stalin, and then under Gorbachev and Yeltsin, and I think is continuing today. I call these periods of great state transformation. There are periods when the leadership in Russia, whether imperial, whether Soviet, uh, or post-Soviet, whether out of fear or out of hope, lays, lays siege to uh, the domestic order in Russia, upending its institutions, transforming its social patterns, uh, even the hierarchy of society's core values. It happened, as I said, in the 16th century uh, under, uh, under uh, Ivan IV and in the other periods subsequently. You expect uh, that during these periods of time of great state transformation, there's going to be an impact on foreign policy. And as I said, I think we have been in one of those periods like that of Ivan IV or of Peter the Great or of Alexander II or of Lenin and Stalin. You would expect that to have an effect on foreign policy. And when I look back on it, I did a chapter in a book that we did a few years ago called uh, Russian Foreign Policy in the 21st Century in the Shadow of the Past, which was an effort to situate Russian foreign policy in 300 years of Russian history and foreign policy. And that chapter was on these periods of great state tra transformation. What it seemed to me happened during those periods of time in terms of their impact on foreign policy were the following things. First of all, it produced a tendency to pursue defensive, in all cases, produced a tendency to pursue defensive objectives by offensive and at times provocative, provocative means. A penchant for manipulating rather than consolidating or cementing relationships. A preference for maneuvering rather than committing to any one or anything. 
been true of all four of the periods that I described in the foreign policy that you saw, and a habit of jeopardizing perspective alliances uh, during these periods of time by appearing to be an unreliable ally, even in those periods of time when the international system tolerated, even promoted the rapid shifting alliances as it did the international system for much of the period from the 16th through the, through the 19th century. A fourth part of the continuity, if you think about it over time, Russia has always been the hinterland of the great Eurasian landmass, uh, and hence geopolitics automatically made it relevant, even important, to the international system wherever the core of that system lay over four or five centuries. The United States, which has been separated by two oceans, therefore geopolitics has in many ways uh, allowed it to remain apart from, even secure from, the international system, wherever the core of that system lay. Uh, that may be blurred these days given the nature of the international system we live in, the global system of our day, but I think over time that has presented a very fundamental continuity in the difference between the United States and Russia. Uh, fifth, the burdens and the disruptive impact of political system, the way we organize ourselves, the values that we celebrate, Russia versus the United States, Soviet Union versus the United States, Putin's Russia versus the United States, has been there for 400 years. Uh, I'm not saying that there is some deterministic impulse or reason that says it will always be there, but if you look for continuity over history, it has been there most of the time, especially from the end of the 19th century through what we've seen subsequently. But there is one other element of continuity that I think is also important. I'm not quite sure how to measure it. Throughout all of those years, the 210 that I've been talking about, Russia is the only major power in international politics with which the United States has not gone to war. It is the only major power for 210 years with which the United States has never gone, never gone to war. Discontinuities. Russia, throughout this time, is by geography a continental power, but beyond what geography dictates, it is a continental power with military power that is sized and focused accordingly. That is for a continental power. The United States in the 20th century emerged as a maritime power with its military power sized and focused accordingly, which has created fundamental differences even when there's an effort to begin erasing or diminishing that, the distinction or the discrepancy. Uh, the second major continuity is, of course, the one that I've referred to several times now, and that is the collapse of a multipolar world that existed from uh, long before the U.S.-Russia relationship began in the, uh, in the 19th century, from the Treaty of Westphalia uh, in the 17th century, 1648, the Treaties of Westphalia, from 1648 forward, that is a multipolar, multiplayer international system has given way or gave way with the, the, I should say, with that classic balance of power dynamic in that earlier period to a bipolar world with uh, the rigidity of alignments that we saw during the Cold War. During the Cold War, you could get defection from an alliance. You got it with China and the Sino-Soviet conflict. You got it with Romania. Uh, and you had it in several other instances, even to some degree with Gaul East France in terms of the Western alliance system, but you couldn't get realignment uh, during that period of time. You could get defection, but not realignment. China did not align with the United States, so it began to play the triangle of the Sino-Soviet conflict. Uh, then uh, the final two things in terms of discontinuity, all of them very powerful that have shaped the 20th century, the last part of the 20th century, and now very much the 21st century, and that is the imperialism as a dominant phenomenon in the 19th century and the 20th century gave way to decolonization as a dominant phenomenon with all of the effects that we saw during the Cold War and that we're still feeling within our own day. Uh, and finally, again, the transformation of the world that had existed before 1945, 1949, 
into what was after that a nuclear world with the United States and the Soviet Union as the two nuclear superpowers, or as uh, Wallstetter described them in the 1950s, two scorpions in a bottle. Contemporary period, and then I'm done. I believe that we're now entering a critical period that we have not yet come to terms with, certainly not government in Washington or in Moscow. Uh, I think it's likely to come down on our heads before we begin recognizing it and dealing with it. Uh, but I think in this second phase of this very short third period, what we begin to see is a dual transformation in critical dimensions. The first is the international system. We know that the liberal order, the so-called liberal international order, is under assault. You hear it talked about every day. A liberal international order that was, at least in theory and by its ideal, coming out of World War II, one based on territorial integrity and peace among nations to be guaranteed by the collective security mechanisms of the United Nations, what we thought we were creating in the, in the UN. Secondly, relatively free international trade and investment, uh, economic development, uh, the management of market disruptions through international financial institutions. Um, that was the liberal international order, even if the communist world had not embraced it as such. After the end of the Cold War, even before that, the Chinese, and then it appeared uh, Russia, had now become part of this liberal international order. Uh, and one other point to it, at least for the West, was sort of the notion of democratic peace, that gradually this world would move toward, with greater democracy, toward greater peace. Democracies don't fight democracy. They fight everybody else, but they don't fight other democracies, the assumption was. Uh, I think what's happening right now, I'm not quite sure what will, what will come of this assault on the... Uh, uh, on the uh, liberal international order, dominated by movements in many parts of the world, not excluding Russia and not excluding other countries that are authoritarian, not just democratic countries. It's anti-establishment. It's anti-globalization. It is the populism that everybody talks about in the United States, in Europe. But there is a version of it with the nativism around nationalism on the Russian side. There's a version of it in China as well. Uh, and, it, and none of it bodes well for the, even the maintenance, let alone the uh, flourishing of the liberal international order. Therefore, I would argue that this U.S.-Russia relationship today, even though I don't think leadership in Moscow or in Washington recognizes it, the international, shift, the international system is shifting under their feet at this point. Uh, and they're entering what will be a tumultuous period in international politics generally, of which the difficulties in their bilateral relationship are simply a part in the present circumstances. But I said there's a dual fundamental transformation because the other one, I believe, is the watershed that this country, the single, still the single most important country in international politics, is beginning to enter simultaneously. I believe what we see now, uh, headlined or highlighted, I should say, underscored by the presidential election is a convergence of three trends. One that we re recognize but haven't really addressed. I call it institutional fatigue. Uh, and the evidence that the system created in this country in the 18th century, a magnificent system in many ways given its continuity, the Constitution and the rest of it, now in many respects uh, has dysfunctional aspects because key principles of it have been warped over time. Whether it's the Electoral College, whether it is redistricting and the effects that it produces along the line, whether it is the way the filibuster works in the Senate, or a whole host of things. That's what I call institutional <coughs> fatigue. That, in turn, uh, particularly combined with the way in which we're able to manipulate uh, through redistricting the way the, vote, uh, the way the voting gets done within the country and the politics that are on the outside of it is intensifying the polarization within this country, and we've, we've seen that long before this last election, but intensely reflected in this last election polarization, which has then reinforced the other phenomena, which is government dysfunction, particularly at the federal level, saved in part by what happens at the lo local level, but a basic dysfunction, an incapacity of the government at this point, at the federal level, 
to deal with fundamental problems, whether it's infrastructure or education or immigration or health policy, uh, whatever it is, we're not solving those problems or even mitigating them in any fundamental way because of this. And I think behind that is a larger issue that we're only beginning to sense in a kind of neuralgic or uh, subconscious fashion, and that is the demographic transformation with this, th within this country. People feel it uneasily, but we know that within the next 20 years, the original core European-based population will become minority. And uh, this popular, demographically, the United States will look very differently. At this point, I think it's creating a kind of unease that feeds into the other two factors that are more immediate that come before it. Where all of that's going, I don't know. I'm not arguing that what happened in November uh, has already told us the rest of the story. Far from it. I think it's all untold at this stage. But it means that this U.S.-Russia relationship that I have at too much of your time's length described over 210 years is now entering another fundamental period with potentially very dramatic factors at work. The watershed in the politics and character of the most important country in the world, the United States, at the same time that the international context for a dare, very deteriorated, dilapidated uh, relationship between the United States and Russia has occurred. Where all of that leads and what uh, somebody will say about the history of U.S.-Russia relations 220 years from now, I don't know. But it should be interesting. Thank you. <laughs>